Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's edition of Civics Live. Uh, originally, I had planned to cover the first of the four pillars this evening, but I've decided that I'm just going to do a brief introduction to the four pillars again and cover an additional bonus topic. Uh, this session shouldn't take too long, and it's more of just an introduction, and we will begin with our in-depth discussion of each of the four pillars next week, May 8th. Go ahead and start off uh, talking about what we're really going to focus on this evening. Um, having the fun part now of remembering. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start now. So, our lesson tonight will focus on what Hunter's four pillars of government are. And I look forward to explaining each of those a little bit more to you and why they are important, as well as how we will discuss them over the course of the next couple of weeks. This will be something we'll be covering throughout the month of May. And then we have an extra, and of course, that is what is the importance of this evening, May 1st? Uh, May 1st has a particular um, resonance, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, during the course of our uh, discussions uh, tonight. Well, let's go ahead and get started with our discussion about the four pillars of American government. And to me, really, this are, these pillars are what make American government unique, unique and prosperous. Uh, the first, of course, being individual liberty. We are a nation that, more so than any other nation, really reinforces the importance and the uh, significance of individual liberty. And the idea that in our nation... We believe that rights and liberty come from God and are granted to the individual. Uh, they're not granted to the state first. They're not granted to any blood right of any noble heirs. They belong to each and every individual. Each and every individual is sovereign. Uh, and as citizens of this nation, uh, is the responsibility of the government to respect them and to uphold those liberties. And, of course, we recognize those liberties through a variety of means uh, in our government. And that ties directly into our second pillar, and that is our Constitution. Uh, we have one of the oldest standing forms of government in the world. And as a republic that utilizes the vehicle of democracy, as I put down there at the bottom, uh, we have created a government that is very effective. And two of those pillars tie directly into the Constitution uh, that make our Constitution strong, that make our Constitution uh, resilient. And those are the separation of powers, a very important concept, a very important pillar, the fact that we have separated out our authorities of the federal government into three separate branches and that each has been given specific powers as well as shared powers. And then we have the pillar of federalism and the fact that American federalism is different than that of other nations. And I'll talk more about that in terms of the fact that we do actually grant our state governments and our local governments with certain degrees of authority that are theirs alone. And uh, we'll definitely spend some time talking about that, and I'll probably even do it a separate month on federalism and uh, intergovernmental relations because it's such an important topic. It really helps understand, really, what our government is. And as we go forward throughout the remainder of 2019, it's important to understand uh, just how important these pillars are and that you will see as we go forth in this discussion of civics, you will see that uh, our... A lot of our sessions will refer back uh, to elements of each of these four pillars. And it's important to know, again, as I said just a little bit a while ago, these virtues and institutions are quite amazing. And they are facilitated by the body that is the American Republic, our representative government. And, of course, that government utilizes democracy as a vehicle. So democracy is part, but as we discussed in our last session, America is a republic. And it's important to understand that in the context of our discussion of government. So uh, talk a little bit about why is it so that these are important? Well, they get to certain elements of our society. Um, first of all, when it comes to liberty, liberty really is our identity. We're identified by our liberty. The idea of individualism is very key to the American identity. Yes, we, we work hard to be uh, a, pop, a public, and I apologize for my sweat. That's just something that happens this time of year. Um, we are, our identity is that of individualism. Yes, we work together, we have shared goals and shared objectives, and we do accomplish a lot together. But more so than any other nation in the world, 
our identity as individuals is key to the identity of America. It is the nation that so often in our history, and even so often today, where individuals can truly achieve so much of their own creativity and volition, and it's important to remember that. Our Constitution itself reinforces our laws and makes it important to understand our system of law. We, we, our Constitution establishes that it is the rule of law and it's supposed to be a principle of equal justice and we can spend a lot of time talking about that and I understand people have different views about how that equal justice is applied as well as the concept of individualism and saying, hey, we haven't always been truthful to those. You're absolutely right about that. But it's still important to remember that our system of a rule of law is unique and is very strong and in my opinion is, is, is far superior to that to much what you see in the rest of the world. When it comes to our separation of powers, it's important to understand how that influences our administration. Not only our administration of the law, which of course is handled through the judicial branch, but also uh, the administration of government and understanding the powers of the executive and the legislative. And uh, we can certainly spend a lot of time talking about the how those are actually uh, applied and whether or not they're necessarily applied the way that the founders intended and if they're actually applied within the framework of our Constitution and potentially looking at it perhaps do they kind of go beyond those and understanding how our administration responds to the issues of the future and particularly in terms of some of the things that people bring forth now like the issues of health care and other material um, material needs of the public and saying how, what's the role the government plays in those. Those are important to think of as well. And then getting to federalism and going even back to individualism, there's the importance of understanding that without personal responsibility, this nation does not necessarily function. Uh, individualism, a, a high degree of individualism requires a high degree of personal responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility, as, uh, is, as it is said. And it's important to remember that that responsibility not only applies to our own responsibilities, but also our responsibilities to our neighbors. And federalism itself achieves personal responsibility because it puts more onus on state and local authorities, but also on state and local society uh, to solve those problems that perhaps are not the responsibility of the national government. In my 20 years of serving in public service uh, in government and with nonprofits, I've learned that government is often tasked with doing things that it is simply not prepared to do. That's not to say that these shouldn't be societal or, or public responsibilities, but perhaps they belong to private society, not necessarily government, and it's important to keep that in mind. And as we move forth, uh, all four of these things that I've identified are directly influenced by pillars, and I've talked about in ways how each pillar kind of ties into each of these important elements of our nation and our identity, our laws, our administration, our personal responsibility. And uh, these are obviously very important. And my goal is over the course of the next several weeks, and we'll start this with our looking back at individual liberty next week, is to utilize and look at the words of our founders and look at how they drafted and codify these concepts into our govern into our founding principle documents and how they've been applied over time. And even look in some degrees, when, especially when it comes to looking at individual liberty as well as um, as the uh, application of our Constitution, looking at those moments where we did not achieve our expectations, we, we did not meet those expectations, where we did not achieve uh, the expectations that are set forth in our government. The Constitution talks of creating a more perfect union, and certainly we strive to do that, but again, it is a mission and a goal, and in some ways has proven to be unattainable at times, yet still remains an important goal for us to move forward with. And that now leads us now into uh, a little extra subject that I wanted to bring up this evening, and that is the significance of what May 1st is. Today is May 1st, known as May Day in a lot of ways. And, you know, we kind of look at it two different ways. Some of you, uh, I had this experience when I was in elementary school. We had a May Day celebration, and it was more of the pagan celebration that uh, is done typically to reflect the changing of the seasons and involve that special little object you see there in the picture, the maypole, where we learn the maypole dance, and you tie the ribbon around the maypole, and then you got to untie the ribbon around the maypole. And yes, we did that one time in elementary school, and if you happen to be from uh, my hometown and happen to go to school with me, you remember that. You remember that occasion. Uh, but the fact is, is that it is a festival that's existed for more than a millennia. It goes back to uh, the mid-first millennia. Uh, AD. Uh, the Romans called it Flor Floralia, uh, referring to the Festival of Flowers, and then it was later carried on by the Celts, who call it Bellatine, 
uh, Beltane, Beltane, I'm sorry, Beltane, also standing for Lucky Fire. It's also, uh, of course, it ties back into Orthodox celebrations of Easter as well as uh, traditional celebrations of Easter, going back to the fact that there was recognition as well as devotion to the Virgin Mary. And uh, you think about one of the things that does happen today is actually today is the National Day of Prayer. Uh, where I work, there was actually a group of local uh, church Christians who today, during that National Day of Prayer, as a team, read the Bible cover to cover. It's an amazing thing to watch. They do this every year uh, from early, early morning, right at daybreak, and they go till about dusk, and they, as a team, read through the entire King James Bible or the NIV. I think they use the King James, but I could be wrong. But today is the National Day of Prayer, and it can tie back to that. So it has a lot of different elements, but perhaps in our society today, it is perhaps best known as a, as a celebration or a commemoration of workers' rights, and those workers' rights celebrations are predominantly advocated and promoted by organizations tied to the political principle, to the political philosophy of socialism. Um, that's kind of what it has become. And, and there's some American history, even though in a lot of ways International Workers' Day, which is also how May 1st is known, is predominantly known uh, and celebrated in Europe. And if you remember very much, uh, if you were a kid of the communist time in the 70s and 80s, you remember how the communists celebrated uh, May Day with their parades in Red Square in Moscow and their showcasing of military armament. Uh, the reality is, is that International Workers' Day's origins come back to the United States. It was in 1886 that the first large-scale U.S. internationals work, uh, Internet May Day workers' uh, protest occurred, and it was when various uh, workers' rights groups at that time started marching for what they called the eight-hour day. At that time, workers, uh, if you work for an industrial company and were paid by an industrial concern, uh, you were expected to work sun up to sundown like you were working in a farm. And uh, that's not to say that that was necessarily right. In fact, it probably wasn't. The conditions in early industry were pretty bad. But uh, the reality was, was that people were expected to work 10 to 16 hours. And so this group of workers, uh, these groups, these first efforts of organization, which of course would lead then later to unions towards the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries, um, began to march for the first right that they wanted, which was the establishment of an eight-hour day, the idea that whatever they were paid, that their day would start it, would start and end for eight days, which of course led to the concept of three working shifts per day. Uh, these riots occurred across the country, but most, com but most prominent was in Chicago, where the riot actually, I'm sorry, the protest lasted actually for, oh, for many days. And by May 3rd, um, by the middle of that week, the, the, the marchers were heavily involved, and there was a location called Haymarket. It was actually near uh, Haymarket, uh, Industri Haymarket Square. Um, and what happened was then was that police started engaging with the rioters, I'm sorry, the protesters. Uh, there were some minor scuffles. Nothing seriously happened until a bomb went off amongst the police officers, killing several police officers. The police then responded with gunfire towards the protesters, killing and wounding uh, killing several protesters and wounding several hundred. So it kind of became then a full-fledged riot, known as the Haymarket Riot. And that event uh, later kind of became the onus for the establishment of May 1st as International Workers' Day uh, around the world, and it is recognized around the world today. Um, now, of course, that's just a little bit of background. Some of you know that there have been worker international workers events going on today. Some of you have probably seen labor organized events today or socialist events today. That's kind of those who use May Day for the for political reasons, as well as some people, of course, are just celebrating spring. Uh, we take, of course, opportunities for anybody to turn in their questions. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You can submit them to Facebook Live under this particular presentation, or you can add them to your comments on Periscope and also on YouTube Live as well. And we look forward to Bruce inviting you to come back uh, next week on May the 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll start off with our first pillar, and that will be the discussion of individual liberty. And I look forward to sharing that with you next week at 9 p.m. on Wednesday, May 8th. Thank you very much and look forward to talking to you then. Have a good evening.